Hello everyone, and welcome to This Nintendo Life. My name is NBZ, and I am here on episode 72 of this podcast. If we were an hour long for each show, you could listen to us for three days straight. I think that's the correct maths, right, Bali? Um, I can't do maths. You're terrible. You're letting me down here. I'm terrible. I am just terrible. But I've got a good, I've got a good stat. What? What is your amazing stat, Bali? And this was the case with episode 71 as well. There are now more episodes of this Nintendo life than there are of Now You're Playing With Power. Oh, really? Really? Man, I wasn't keeping track of that at all. There you go. Episode 35 was the last episode of Now You're Playing With Power, and episode 36 was the first episode of this Nintendo life. Oh, that's crazy. I had no idea. Well, since our rebranding happened, we've... Uh, Certainly been chugging along, um, and it doesn't feel like that was that long ago, so I'm surprised. But half of our lifetime has now been encompassed by the new title of the show, which is cool. That's uh, a neat thing to think about. It's a landmark. Um, It is a landmark, for sure. Uh, So, Bali, I'm joined by you. I didn't introduce you at all, but you're my co-host on this show, and you also talk about Nintendo and games. I try. I try. I mean, we... we (laughs) Sometimes you do, uh, whenever you have time to play them. I know you're always quite busy, but... Uh, Indeed. Uh, you know, well, we get around to it. Uh, so, Bali, uh, why don't you run us down for the lay of the land? What are we doing on the show today? For episode 72, we have what we've been playing. We have some of your emails, and for our third segment, it's got to be. It just has to be. You know, there's one There's one topic on everyone's minds at the moment and that are that is these new nx rumors so we're going to give you the lowdown on our opinions and everything going forward yes uh it's getting so close to when we'll actually know things about nx but for the moment you're gonna have to deal with us bullshitting so get ready (laughs) for some of that um okay so i guess without further ado bali let's just jump into this brand new episode with uh, some video games and some things we've been playing and i think you have an interesting thing to talk about this week i do i got a ps4 well, did you really though <laughs> not really so in my house in brussels i live in a house with eight other people um and we communally got PS4 for the flat for the house, so I own one ninth of a PS4. Sure, I guess. Um, so yeah, we got the we got the Star Wars bundle. So it comes with Star Wars Episode Seven on Blu-ray, as well as Lego Star Wars uh, for PS4. And I I knew that we were getting the PS4 a bit in advance, so I borrowed a couple of games from my good friend Shaq. So I borrowed Star Wars Battlefront as well as FIFA. I believe it's. 14? Um, okay, I can't remember. so a couple of years 14. out of date. A couple of years out of date. Not that it makes much difference, all those games are basically the same, but sure. So, I'm like getting used to how all the menus and things work, because you know, all my experience with Playstations and be- being at friends' houses, it's always someone else with the menus, someone else controlling what's, what I'm playing, someone else helping me do X, Y, and Z, whereas this was very much like me and my flatmate just from the ground up working out how to play a, like a PS4 and how to set it up, how to do all this. How to make an account, basically. How to make an account, and we had a lot of trouble making the, making an account, actually. Like it, it kept disconnecting, we didn't know whether that was our internet or the servers or a bit of both, and eventually, like, you know, I made an account and I I have I now have a PSN account. I think that's what it's called, right? What What is your name if people want to add you? My name is the same as my Twitter handle, the same as my Meverse name. It's Ballyman91. That's B A W L Y M A N nine one. So go ahead and add Bally. I still haven't added you. I don't think. I don't. I don't even know what that means to add me on that. I don't. I don't actually know what that does. So I mean, you know. it allows people to play multiplayer with you. But seeing as you don't have PlayStation Plus, that's not going to be a possibility. Yes. So. so that's what I'm just about to get to. Is you know, I bor- borrowed this great game. I've really been enjoying Star Wars Battlefront. I had played it briefly uh, when it came out last year, but Shaq's lent it to me, and I've been playing a lot more of it. And yeah, I can't play online because I don't have PS Plus and that's really, really annoying and it it's frustrating because I'm not really in... I have so many Nintendo games and non-PS4 games to play that I, I just want the PS4 to be this little this thing that I sort of dabble with every now and then and I'm not feeling like paying for PlayStation Plus is maybe worth it. I mean, it's like 30 to 40 pounds for the year. And I, maybe I'm being stingy and being like, oh, I don't want, I don't want to do it. But I don't know. I, I just feel like it's a bit 
too much, especially seeing as for the time being, all I want out of that PS4 in terms of PlayStation Plus is just to play some Battlefront online. Um, and and even then, you're probably not going to play that forever, right? Like, you'll play quite no. a lot of it to start with, and then you'll fall out of it, and you won't really go back. So that's like... it. Maybe it's a sort of situation where maybe you pay for PS Plus for a month or something, like the five quid or whatever, which could yeah. be a convenience. Um, it would allow you to maybe download a couple free games that are available then and have your Battlefront fun and then be like, well, okay, we're done now and I don't need to worry about it anymore. But I don't know, whatever you want, really. Yeah, definitely. And like, and, and Track's been really great. He's saying like, oh no, you can just log in as me whenever you want to play Battlefront. Or like, he's even said like, you can log in as me, download Ratchet and Clank, which he owns. And like, I just have to play it sometime when he's away from his PS4. He doesn't mind me doing that. So like, there's options out there for me to dabble in some PlayStation four games um, and obviously you're sure. coming over to brussels and we can, i am yeah i i don't mind spending a bit of money and going in for a few a couple of games you know we were talking about journey maybe and some other yes but some other shorter experiences that i definitely don't have yeah there's, there's a few indie games that are available on ps4 that i absolutely adore and are not mm. going to be coming to nintendo platforms ever really yeah, exactly so i would love to watch you play through them and experience them again uh so we're gonna maybe do that uh when i'm over there and for our gamescom stuff so so overall like i'm I am getting used to the system, and it's pretty great. Like, I, I think it, it, it's very different to Nintendo. I wouldn't say that it's particularly better or worse, necessarily. I just think it's, it takes a lot of getting used to. Um, like, the home screen stuff, how do you feel about how it's all laid out and everything? Is it easy enough to move around? Or is this the case, which I hear a lot of people saying is, like, the system that you're used to is the one that you think is the best. And as a result, when you try something else, you're like, oh, this is a bit weird and awkward. And because not many people own a Wii U, most people are like, oh, the Wii U is weird and the system is bad and everything, the OS is terrible. But for you, as someone going into a different ecosystem, I'm sure the opposite is true because you're so used to using a Nintendo platform. I, I I would agree that I find Nintendo simpler. Um, I, th- I, th- I think it would be really interesting if you put some people who hadn't experienced anything into a room together and had to try out each system, like from box to starting up a game, like seeing which system they thought was the easiest. Um, yeah, that would be a cool experiment. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to stick my by my guns. I think Nintendo would do quite well in that, to be honest. I mean, they are aimed at maybe a slightly younger audience from many experiences, so who knows? But anyway, that's hyperbole. But sure, I I really like Star Wars Battlefront. I think I mentioned it last year, like I said when it came out. It's an unbelievably good looking game. It is so cool. And like, I was just trying to think of other Star Wars first person shooters. And I'm, I was just thinking like there was that Attack of the Clones, like Clone Wars game, I think. I think that was on PS2. On GameCube? Uh, I don't think it came to GameCube. Um, Are you it, thinking of just the original Battlefront or Battlefront 2 on PS2? Maybe it was called Battlefront. I can't remember. No, ugh, no I want to say it was called like Clone something something. But anyway, it like the clone. That, I remember the Clone Wars game was one that you owned on GameCube. Yeah, that I mean that one. that was like a Rebel. That was like a Rogue Squadron esque game. Even though it was made by. It Super also Rebel. had like Mace Windu running around on exactly. shoot with his lightsaber. Yeah, parts, it was crazy. But, um, but anyway, I I just think like. It feels just so crisp and it looks unbelievable and everything from the sound design to, um, you know, the way that Luke swings his lightsaber, it all feels great. And, and that's the, I think that's just the, the quirkiest thing of this game is like, there's no other games I feel where it, there's a first person shooter on top of that with characters running around with lightsabers like it just feels so cool and and like my favorite mode by a mile um online is this mode where you all are you're all playing as either rebels or imperial troopers and you have to chase either the hero or the villain um and once you kill the villain or the hero you rotate so whoever got the most hits on the villain becomes the villain and then the aim of the game is whoever can get the most kills as the villain 
wins and you're in this constant rotation where people are trying to get shots on the on the hero or the villain in order to be them and then get kills and it's just a great mode because you're ultimately just loads of dudes chasing after luke and luke is just being a badass and deflecting all the bullets and all this it's just such a a star wars fans dream of like what an fps should be i and think it's also funny that you should choose that mood uh, that mode as your favorite seeing as it's very reminiscent of the asymmetric multiplayer design of something like nintendo land where you have oh, one definitely. player who has a single objective and you have a group of other players who are going up against them and as someone i know who you love all those games like the luigi one and the animal crossing one in nintendo land i'm not surprised that this is what stands out to you yeah definitely and and that's where this game, I feel, is, is, is pretty perfect for someone like me who has very little FPS experience but is a massive Star Wars fan, um, isn't overly fussed about all the guns and the mechanics and who, oh, who, what's got the best headshot and all this, and I don't even know terms to even make that joke. But right. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm just not someone who cares that much about the technicalities of FPSs. And the second, I'm just like, give me Luke and that lightsaber. Give me Darth Vader. Like, these are just the cool... And not just those characters. The AT-ATs and the AT-STs and you can fly TIE Fighters and X-Wings and... Uh, to be honest, they don't even handle that well. But the no. idea <laughs> the idea that you can be in a 40-player online game with the two sides... And when I'm talking about the two sides, that's... For the Imperials, you've got the Emperor, Darth Vader, Boba Fett. On top of that, the AT-ATs and all the troopers and like all of the uniforms of all the clone... Uh, not clone troopers, dear me. Storm troopers. Storm troopers, um, yeah. Is, is, perfect like they have the snow troopers and the and the squad squaddies who like what ride the uh speeder bikes so like they've got all the outfits just perfectly summed up and it's just a really really cool experience i should also add like they've they've got dlc heroes and villains as well that include like greedo um nib nib i can never say his name right nim num nim num yeah. Uh, uh, who else have they got? They've got some bounty hunter as well. Who's has, has Shaq bought all these? Is that no, what, why you have access? Not. No, no, no. But when you're playing online, others can have them. Right. So in yeah. that mode I was just describing, if you have bought them, then you have the option of choosing them when it's your turn to be the hero villain. So it's funny you bring up the DLC because that, that's been a thing of great contention regarding Battlefront. The idea that it launched with basically hardly any content and people were extremely. Uh, angry uh when they said oh that we're gonna have all this dlc later next year and it's basically the price of the, the whole game again like another 60 dollars yeah. for whatever dlc pack is and i do feel that that's kind of a predatory thing that people are going to be preying on all this star wars nostalgia that people have i mean it's going to work for them because this yeah. game has hit huge on the mainstream it sold like 14 million copies which is ridiculous that's really and cool. it's basically a very casual game and i think this has come under a lot of criticism from people who play a lot of fps and who are really deep into that scene is that there's not a lot of depth to battlefront but that's fine i think because it's not targeting that same audience it's someone like you for example who doesn't have much experience mm. and is just there for all the star warsness i think the star warsness is absolutely fucking nailed in this game exactly and that's really what you want out of it and the fact that you know it's not that mechanically deep is not really a concern. And it's very telling that like Shaq was very open to me borrowing this game from him because like he is someone who is really into his first person shooters. He used to play a ton of COD. Um, he really likes Battlefield. That's what yes, right. Battlefield. Battlefield. Um, and he's like, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm sort of done with this game, uh, Bally. You can borrow it. And like I asked him like what do you think of it mechanically like what annoys you he's just like yeah it's just not great he's like he has always has to turn off the like auto aim and things like that and then i sort of asked him like what do you think of like the star wars guns or like the 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 because so they basically overheat um rather than having ammo which is quite interesting. right yeah that's, that's then, a cool mechanic as well actually it's a much more casual friendly one Exactly, and Shaq immediately said, like, oh, I way prefer ammo, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, because I, cause I personally absolutely love the idea of not having ammo for this, and it's also just really thematic and works so well. Uh, yeah, so, it's yeah. one less thing to think about, so it, exactly. it helps, and like, just getting into the game itself. It's just a really great game, um, and it's a really nice 
way to just dip into a bit of PlayStation 4, especially like I've got friends visiting, including Shaq, um, in Brussels right now. And it's just a really great game to just sit around and watch others play, really. It's just loving it. So yeah. Sweet. Good stuff. Battlefield. I've also been dipping into a bit of FIFA, which I'll mention very quickly. Um, I really didn't play much FIFA ever, like, growing up. I had, like, World Cup 98 on N64. Yeah. Like, and that's, like, a second-hand game from, like, yonks ago. Uh, Do you ever remember coming around to my place and playing on uh, my original PlayStation? Well, Red Card, obviously, <laughs> on GameCube, which is a fantastic game. Uh, but on my PlayStation, I had This Is Football 98, and I also had FIFA 2000. Okay. Uh, FIFA 2000, probably one of my favorite PS1 games. Really? Well, I think yeah. we played FIFA 2000 like once or twice. But um... I fucking love FIFA 2000 because the AI was terrible, and so I would just go into a season as whoever and just run through if people you, constantly. If you like jump from FIFA 2000 to like FIFA say 2014-15, which I think this one is, it, it's crazy how much like it, it simulates. So I'm a, I'm a huge football fan. I follow Chelsea FC massively. I love football to watch uh i've never been into fifa that much but i can totally see the appeal having like sat down with it like i if i was if i owned a like a ps4 properly and got into it i could see myself buying fifa like solidly maybe every four or five years yeah Uh, and that's because it's great seeing all the all the character faces all the players all the new teams and just the stadiums are fantastic and it's so cool and the the PS4 looks glorious. Like it's just such a great looking system, and it, this game and the EA games in general are just incredibly good looking. I personally think NHL is my favorite out of the sort of sporty simmy style games, but yeah. uh, FIFA is totally it's totally a lot of fun. Um, I'm really really bad at it, but luckily a lot of my friends yeah. are quite bad. at I'm it. I'm terrible as well. One of uh, my friends in Glasgow has FIFA, and I remember playing a bit earlier this year and just getting my teeth kicked in like really. Exactly. Exactly. And like, that's fine. But I mean, it's just, it's good fun to dip in and out of every now and then. Um, I, I definitely prefer Battlefront. Uh, that's I think that's an absolute Star Wars blast. But uh, FIFA's good. It's cool. It's interesting. So good first experience with the PS4 then, Bali? Get positive, yes. I got what I was expecting, really. Uh, not too much more, which is maybe a downside, but it's very early days. Um, and just, so, just really quickly, how do you feel about the DualShock for the controller? Do you think it's uh, a good controller? I think it's fine. I've always found those places... I don't like the fact that, that they have sort of... It's very hard to describe, um, but it's... They have, like, flat surfaces that... It's just not a very comfortable controller, to be honest. Okay. I, don't know, I don't know how to say it very well, but uh, it's it's just not. I I've, I think that stuff like the gamepad feels nicer. I think it feels better than say, I don't know, a Nintendo 3DS. But that's not saying much. Like, no, yeah. Uh, but I just think it's it, it could be doing better. But, uh, okay. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to try and get to LEGO Star Wars at some point in the future, and I have been playing Fire Emblem Birthright, which I will hopefully finish up for next time and talk about then. Excellent. Sorry, overran MBZ. No problem. Playing. Um, so this last couple of weeks, I've been finishing some things. I closed out Fire Emblem Fates Conquest, and uh, that is one of the best Fire Emblem games released in years, Bally. It is... Oh. Absolutely fantastic. I think the end game was suitably challenging. Uh, one of the last chapters in particular is one of the most difficult maps I have ever played in any Fire Emblem game. It took me so much strategy, so much reworking of characters. I decided I wasn't going to grind people out. I was going to go the cheap way and do it. I was going to think about it. I was going to try and devise some ways of getting around the problem. And let me tell you, the rewards and the satisfaction you have for doing that in Conquest are just so much greater they really are but you beat it on classic i did i beat it on classic um well the thing about the last chapter is it doesn't really matter if people die because it doesn't save like you save before the last chapter and yeah. then you can have stuff like afterwards. the final boss in zelda yeah yeah it's pretty pretty much that similar setup um so i did lose a few people in the very last chapter but it's it's hard to keep everyone alive at that point because they really throw the whole wall at you like they they go a whole hog right at the end um but finishing it off you can clearly tell that the stories for both birthright and conquest are unfinished 
and deliberately so, and they don't really reveal much, you don't really get satisfying conclusions, the whole real arc of what's going on is never really explained, and it's funny because after beating Conquest, I started Revelation for a little bit, and that's going to be a game that's just kind of ongoing in the background, I think. I'm not going to, like, focus on it too much. But the first couple of chapters of Revelation, I learned more about what was really going on in this story than I did in the whole of the last two games. Uh, so clearly they are setting this up as the real story is Revelation, and people are going to die and things are going to go bad in the other two, but that's where it's going to be end capped. That's a good way to get it to play all three, isn't it? It is, I guess. If you care about the story, which, to be honest, it's... I do. It's I'm trash, it. I think. It's trash, yeah, so... Nah, nah, um, anyway, the Conquest story I actually thought was better than Birthright. I think a lot of people have said it's worse. But I just think Birthright's a very bog-standard hero trophy, you know, like, save the kingdom. And Conquest tries to deal with it in a different way. Doesn't quite stick the landing, but is definitely more interesting mm. um, as, as far as the approach goes. I'll have, so, to, I'll have to try Conquest before the end of the year. No, I really think you should, Bally. It's. I've said it shits all over Birthright. You're really liking Birthright. I don't know how you'll feel about it because it is a, a challenging game, but mm. I think it's just way more rewarding and satisfying as a strategy experience. It just is emblematic, pun not intended, uh, of uh, what Fire Emblem should be. I think uh, I'm getting better at Fire Emblem. I've decided. Yeah, totally. Totally think, getting better. I think I can I handle think it. You're better at Fire Emblem than I am at Advance Wars at this point. Perhaps, I can say with some but I've confidence. definitely had a lot more practice. So you have, you have. We'll see. Um, so yeah, that that was great. Uh, definitely in the front running for game of the year, I'll say. Uh, other things, I finished off Tokyo Mirage Sessions. I'm actually probably going to talk about that on another podcast, uh, the Nintendo Show, hopefully at some point later this month. So uh, I'll point you guys <laughs> towards that. Well, John actually knows what he's talking about, so I can actually have a good conversation with him Whoa. about this game. You know, not to slam you, Bali, <laughs> so but that's true. It's 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 very true. Um, but a couple of things that I have been playing recently. Uh, one, which was me ticking off another humble bundle game, and that is my last 3DS. I think downloadable title because the other ones i have are street fighter. Uh, street fighter and rhythm thief both of which are actually retail games or originally were retail games uh but the one that i finally got around to was retro city rampage dx um and this is one that i wasn't really too interested in it's one of those that i just got and i'm like well i got it so i might as well play it uh and it was surprisingly pretty cool it's very short took me about three hours but it is essentially a top-down grand theft auto game uh, re- really reminded me uh, of some Game Boy Grand Theft Auto stuff back in the day. I remember going on a trip to Rome back when I was quite young, and one of my friends had his Game Boy, and he had the Game Boy version of Grand Theft Auto. Uh, and I remember like playing a bit of it, and it being this top-down experience where you just jump in cars and run around and do all the standard GTA stuff, but um, on this handheld device. And it really gave me a bit of nostalgia for that, funnily enough. And I was really enjoying it, like jumping around, finding what cars are fast and which ones you like to like mow people down with and that kind of shit. And uh, it's generally like standard mission design where it's like go into a place, kill some guys, that sort of thing. But they do put twists on it where the game is so incredibly reference heavy. Like... There's stuff from Metal Gear Solid, there's stuff from, I don't know, uh, the original Legend of Zelda, there's stuff from Grand Theft Auto, obviously, like, stuff from Back to the Future, like, all these 80s references, Mm. lots of stuff just crammed in there, a lot of the dialogue is laced with puns and with references from lines from different films and from games, Um, it's really, this guy has not been shy about where he's pulling from, and to some degree, that stuff can get a bit pandery, I think, like, certainly it can wear thin and there was the point where i was like i don't really care about because the story wasn't very good to be honest like it's Mm. just a bunch of dialogue being thrown at you so i did skip past most of it but um it's cool to see how he represents all these different franchises in there i just i just like that um i do think the game gets a little grindy towards the end like some of the difficulty spikes happen and the combat is pretty bad especially when you're doing melee stuff you're just like from a top-down perspective kind of mashing a punch button or you're using like a you know hitting someone in with a wooden bat or something like that and there's not really a good way to like defend yourself or get away like you can just jump away from people funnily enough one of the main forms of attacking people is jumping on their head mario style like just hitting (laughs) a goomba which is pretty funny um but uh, aside from that like there was a certain area where I was fighting a bunch of ninjas and my health was going down so fast against them I just couldn't find a way to beat them it took me really a lot of bang my head against the wall to get through this like kind of last section um but I did do it and uh 
Yeah, I'm glad I played it because I think it's uh, kind of a refreshing thing, especially on 3DS. It's a nice thing to have portably and uh, you can kind of just burst through it with a podcast on, um, which is what I did. Uh, so I'm sure you'll get around to it eventually, Bally, as you will do with oh, all these Humble Bundle games. Definitely. I'm always um, looking for a, a quick, short experience to just clean up. Yeah, to have alongside something longer, for sure. Like our um, band. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> keep... Play Earthbound People, it's our back club game, uh, which we'll talk about <laughs> later, of course. Uh, but the last thing I want to talk about is something that came out yesterday as a recording. Uh, yesterday, Bally was an important day. Uh, not that Nintendo would acknowledge it, but it was the 30th... Happy birthday. Sorry. There we go. I just, no, I'm just going to let you give you some room to sing to your, your favorite child, Metroid. Um, it was Metroid's 30th birthday yesterday, um, which... I would love if Nintendo came out and did something cool, but apparently they just don't care about Metroid. Um, So the fans have to do stuff for them. And basically, yesterday was released a fan project that has been in the work for the best part of a decade, apparently, I found out. I was like, oh my god, that's crazy. Uh, It's called Another Metroid 2 Remake, and it is essentially a from-the-ground-up remade version of the original Metroid 2, which was on the Game Boy, uh, on your PC. It's a downloadable, executable, you just um, put it on your desktop and launch it and you have controller support and everything. And it is one of the most impressive fan-made projects I have ever seen in my life. Legitimately, Bally, aside from a few issues, this game could have been made by Nintendo themselves and I would have been suitably impressed. Hmm. It basically takes the Zero Mission engine, uh, uses a lot of assets from there, but there's a bunch of new assets as well. A lot of the enemies are new, a lot of different colors and palettes and stuff thrown in there, but it uses that stuff, improves on it. Essentially, this is Zero Mission 2. If I was to pitch it to you, this is how zero mission made metroid playable this makes metroid 2 playable in a really fantastic way and it's way. such a slick game zero mission like that's it is, such yeah. a good idea to use that engine yeah samus just controls like an absolute dream it's so fun to move around and it's so quick and i think a lot of people i was reading the NeoGAF thread are saying like man it's so hard to go back to super metroid after playing like these gba games because as i attest to i think super metroid is quite sluggish and slow in terms of the control department and these games are just so much faster and they feel much more immediate um and that is what speaks to me most of all so some of the things that this guy has kind of uh, swished up in this game uh there is a full map obviously but he's added a thing that axiom verge had which is a marker system so you can plop down a marker to a place to remember to go back to get an item things like that like secret hidden areas uh he has added uh a bunch of peripheral things that were from metroid prime so for instance when you have health drops and missile drops if you charge beam in metroid prime they suck in towards you so you don't have to worry about getting them exactly on the screen and he's just brought that simple change into this game which seems like a very easy idea but it works great and it is a smart addition you know the sort of thing where if you thought nintendo would make a new 2d metroid it's one of those things you'd expect them to probably do right is to maybe take some of these Mm. modern ideas and, and implement them um and there's also a bunch of lore funnily enough every time you enter a new area it starts saying like scanning for information and stuff and you press the start button and it brings up this whole page of like text and background on the area and what happened it's literally the scanning visor from metroid prime but kind of automatically done for you and there's this whole like almost encyclopedia of uh, material on the metroids and what's happening on the planet and everything it's it's so well presented the ui is incredibly clean and nice to look at it's just on every front valley it's just such an impressive visual improvement and makeover of what that old game was because obviously the old game didn't have color so that was the whole thing with the varia suit having the shoulder blades added to distinguish um and there was no map in metroid 2 either and because of that like knowing where the hell you were at any one time seemed like kind of an impossibility so the way that this game has come in here and just cleaned up every issue that anyone could have with that original game is astonishing it's really blowing my mind and i'm just so incredibly happy about it um do you think that you would attempt to play this at any point you think because it's the sort of thing that could run on a mac i think without much trouble obviously you'd have to connect a controller to it but um would there be a situation where you'd ever be able to play this ballet yeah i mean if if i had was able to connect a controller easily and you know i was looking for some 2d metroid to play then definitely yeah i mean i think 
I think I played all the two D Metroids well apart from like yeah, Metroid Two and there's exactly. Metroid, so I think this would be a really good option. Yeah, I mean the thing is I don't want to play Metroid Two anymore. After playing this, I can't go back to it. You see, I would I would be up for trying it. Maybe not uh, maybe not guaranteed to complete it, but like three pounds fifty or something I think it costs on the eShop. It's definitely uh, if you don't care about finishing it, sure. That's yeah. I would grant you that. But that even in this game, I do think there are long stretches where you're kind of navigating through areas that I imagine in the original game look very similar to one another. So I can find you easily getting lost uh, yeah, if you were definitely. to play that. So that's the problem there. But um, the structure of Metroid 2 is very different. And I never really realized how different it was until I started playing this. But the essential premise is Samus is on a mission to clean up SR388 and basically perform genocide by murdering every Metroid possible. And you have a counter which basically tells you how many Metroids are left alive and how many you need to kill. And each area consists of going into a place, finding out the routes, getting to the end, and killing an Alpha Metroid or a Gamma Metroid or a Zeta or whatever. Like, they start evolving as they go on. And these are the forms of Metroid that you see a little bit in Metroid Fusion. Like, when you go out onto the... The, one of the ships near the end, you can find this uh, kind of scientific area, and they have in jars, like, all the different Metroids. Obviously, you fight the Omega Metroid at the very end of Fusion, um, but you you basically see all these creatures which were invented for this game, for Metroid 2, is when they first came into the series. And it's, it's funny, because they really haven't used them in another game since then as enemies, and they're really nicely designed. They all look very unique and different, so um, I'd like to see them revisit, like, the evolutionary chains of the Metroids later on, but essentially you're going in killing them all and then the ground rumbles and i think like i'm not sure what that does exactly but it's supposed to open up new areas and then you go and find somewhere else that you can get to with your new power up um so it's it's not the same of like you're obviously you're getting power ups and you're getting uh fighting bosses and all that stuff but the way that you're pushed through the game is it is a different kind of motivator you know it's not it's not the same idea it's more like you're the aggressor you're not like running away from things you're the killer coming in and murdering yeah. everyone you're the it's, sax <laughs> exactly you are i wouldn't be surprised if like the, uh, the sax is just samus from metroid 2 just being let loose <laughs> in in time future. travel that's, yeah yeah that, that, that's a weird one um but it's like it's not just that this game is taking that engine and improving and adding all this stuff it's just the amount of care and detail and polish that has clearly gone into it really it makes me want to give this guy money somehow i don't know if i can but you know like i just feel bad like not even paying for this thing it's so incredibly well executed. you know his name i don't know but there's he has a website a blog uh that you can go and check out and i'll probably link it maybe in the show notes so that you can take a look um but uh it's absolutely worth uh going and, and giving a go especially have controller support on your pc um i would say that uh, there's no reason not to especially in an era when nintendo are just not giving us metroid products that we want that is i mean there's one coming out this month um which maybe we could talk about very briefly because i completely forgot that we played the demo of blast yeah. ball but uh, that came out what did you think of that Bally? i think immediately it's one of those games where it visually really runs and looks great. Like, it, it, it's something that... And this was... A, you claimed uh, was the case with a uh, codename Steam. Is that yes. It, it kind of... It doesn't look great when you're watching trailers or watching anything on 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 a, a PC screen or anything when you're watching demos and things. But the second you've got it in your hand and you're playing it, it actually looks really great. And I, I definitely agree. I think the controls get some takes some getting used to it feels different to metroid prime in a strange way i i, I wish they'd tried to stick to the metroid prime controls a, bit, a little more closely um especially seeing as it's in the name uh and <laughs> it's just blast ball's fine I, I don't think it's much fun but i'm definitely open to the idea of uh the co-op and the other missions i think they could be quite cool yeah i really question why they made blast ball the demo it doesn't make a lot of sense from a marketing perspective i question why they made blast ball yeah i mean when you think about it next level's heritage is in the mario strikers games so to okay, some degree maybe, yeah. 
they know that sort of style of gameplay and they just wanted to do it as a fun extra but like why is the fun extra the thing you push to the forefront like why not give us a a co-op mission to test out and really try and sell someone on this game because that's going to be the bulk of it like the metroid style you know monster hunter-esque um cooperative uh, gameplay is going to be what most people are interested in finding out about and yet they decide to put out the inferior product that everyone was making fun of it just seems counterintuitive to me um and while yeah as you said it controls fine and it looks okay it's not super fun it feels like it you, there's not a good level of skill that can be applied to it it's very clunky to some degree like obviously these comparisons are going to be made anyway but after rocket league came out you can't not be compared to rocket league you know and exactly everyone talks about how fluid and and nice that game is and this is just kind of the opposite it's a slow kind of trudgy affair um and doesn't really do much for me like i played one game online unlocked like um a creed skin which was cool i guess that's a nice treadmill for people to unlock skins and stuff but yeah it didn't really didn't really impress me unfortunately um so basically play uh the metroid 2 remake another metroid 2 remake is what it's called um a lot of interesting redesigned bosses like i think none of these were in the original game and he's basically taken some old bosses from previous metroid games given them like new attack patterns and i was playing one today that was so intense and tough and challenging and legitimately like better designed than some actual metroid bosses in the real games like it's so stunning how good this game is i cannot stress to you enough like it's legitimately one of my favorite things i've played this year and it was made by a fan project this is not like a main studio not like these guys are talented they should make something else i'll tell you that um because this has really impressed me so Thumbs up for that. Go try it out. And uh, I think that's going to bring us to the end of the segment, Bowie. You have one more game you played that you made a video on? Oh, I did. You're, you're correct. Thanks for pointing that out to me. I completely forgot. There's been too many things that I've been uh, on my Way plate. Way too many. Uh, I played Abzu, which is a... Pretty much uh, the pitch is its Journey Underwater. If you've not played Journey, it was uh, you know a game released in 2012 by that game company. Very kind of um, ethereal, uh, very uh, exploratory game in the desert. And this is basically that game underwater. You're swimming around with fish and kind of... It's a very calming experience, very light puzzle solving. Not even, I wouldn't even call it puzzle solving. It's more going up to a thing and pressing a button to activate stuff. Um, but it is very cool and it's an experience that i really enjoyed and if you want to hear more thoughts on it i made a video about it which is kind of like a casual game review and that will be on i guess we'll put it on our twitter i think it's on the tnl podcast twitter it'll be we'll we'll retweet it we'll we'll tell people where to go um you can find it on my twitter as well um and obviously that's all at the end of the show uh so listen out for that when we talk about it but uh yeah i think that's pretty much it bali um looking forward to maybe playing some stuff at Gamescom and talking about it. Uh, mm-hmm. Although I'm not sure we'll be talking about that next time, maybe the time after. We'll, we'll see how see. that sh- stuff shakes out. We but uh, uh, Yeah, things things are happening. Things are happening in the world of this Nintendo life. Um, okay, so we're going to get out of this section and we'll uh, rejoin you after a brief musical break with some of your emails. So don't go anywhere. We shall be right back. time for the second segment and that means one thing and one thing only that means it's time for your emails but before we get into the emails lined up this week i will remind you of our email address which is this nintendo life at gmail.com that is this nintendo life at gmail.com so 
Send in more emails. We yeah, need we, some. We always need more. You know, so much, so much going on right now in the world of Nintendo, the world of video games, the world in general. We want to hear about it right now. So, our first email is from Elias, who's from Germany. Hi, MBZ and Bally. I have a question about a topic that has been bothering me for a while now. The vibration feature in controllers. What are your thoughts on the vibration feature in controllers in the current times? Do you think it's still technology that should be used? I personally think vibrating controllers are super annoying and I always turn vibration off when I get the chance to do it. It may have been a neat concept when it was introduced, but nowadays it doesn't add anything to the gaming experience. Additionally, without vibration, controller batteries would last longer and the manufacturing cost for a controller could probably go down and that could make them a bit cheaper for the consumer I really would like to hear your opinions on this topic thanks Ellis well I think this is a really interesting thing to think about Bali um, I've always enjoyed having vibration in controllers and I think it's so the interesting thing about it is I feel it adds some tangibility to playing a game that we haven't had in any other way uh, until we've gotten to the stage with VR the idea of being more connected to the game you're playing and having feedback that makes you feel more part of it has really only been achieved through stuff like vibration in controllers hmm. um, and I like it for those reasons but I totally understand where he's coming from you know the idea that it messes up batteries and you know makes controllers more expensive is certainly an admirable thing and when you think about it stuff like handhelds don't have vibration in them like your 3DS doesn't have any vibration exactly. and I'm not sure I really lose much from it um but I don't know. How, how do you feel about it, Bali? I, I don't feel particularly strongly one way or the other. I, in general, I do like vibrations, you know, like when we're, say, playing Smash Brothers, it's quite satisfying to yeah. smash off the stage and get the vibration. I must add, and we've mentioned this on the show before, but the Wii U gamepad has a very tinny, terrible sense of vibration. Something yeah, like I was going to mention that. It is yeah. incredibly loud, and it just sounds horrible. Yeah, and it doesn't even vibrate much. It's just very... It's a very fine buzz, almost like an electric toothbrush. It's not quite what you want out of a gamepad controller like for example the Wii U Pro controller feels a lot more hefty when it's vibrating um, but Definitely. I completely agree with you MBZ there's so many games that like everything on 3DS uh, handhelds in general just no vibration still plenty of you know fighting games action based games driving games um, and they, I don't think they suffer too much. So I, if like if, Ninte if Nintendo says for the NX, and we're going to talk far more about the NX to come in the show, if they say like, oh yeah, there's no vibration, I'd just be like, I don't really mind. That uh, seems like a logical decision, especially uh, with the point that Elias raised about battery life and things like that. And if the, these NX rumors are true, and you know it's going to be so handheld focused, like it'd be mad to put some sort of hefty uh, vibrating. Uh, um, ability into that uh, console, it'd just be mad. Yeah, well, I, I think it really depends on game to game and how well the feedback has been implemented. So, for example, I always come back and I talk about how I love the sound design in Metroid Fusion. The way that the game makes you feel when you're controlling it really helps by hearing those noises and feeling them not necessarily through the controller but through the audio the game feels good to play right and i think that sometimes if a game is lacking in that department and doesn't have good sound design then you can crutch on something like vibration to kind of uh, loop that feedback to the player and give them a sense of tangibility and the character going through something or you know feeling something in the game um and that's where i think like it can be used to benefit certain games but again like it depends on how well it's implemented from that standpoint there's certainly times when you find there are cutscenes happening and sometimes i'll put the controller down watching a cutscene say in xenoblade for example and then all of a sudden oh god the controller starts buzzing because some robot has crashed into the ground and because i'm not holding the controller it just starts making this horrible noise on the table yeah. and it's like oh shit i should have like been holding that at the same time maybe to like wrap myself more up 
in it, but um, it, it is weird when that happens. Also, there's this funny thing that Jeff Gersman mentioned uh, when he was using Windows 10 when it was not out for everyone else. He was in the preview program, and his Xbox One controller, when plugged in, every time he turned his PC on, it would just buzz by itself and start vibrating on the table, like fall off and stuff like that. So I certainly think that though vibration has a place and it is useful here and there, I don't know that we lose much from not having it. Um, And I think that when we're moving into this future of having VR games and stuff like that, I think there are better ways to maybe involve you in an experience than just like, hey, this is shaking and therefore it's universally meaning something. Like the vibration itself can't necessarily be adjusted to be that subtle or different. And so it's this universal thing that can be applied to multiple situations. Mm. And sometimes it works really well. Other times it's just kind of pointless. Um, I mean, it's interesting what you're saying. And like, I think it's definitely almost each to their own. Like everyone feels like, oh, I love vibration or, oh, I don't really care about it. And maybe a lot in the middle. Um, Imagine if Nintendo or anyone went back to something like the N64 where like vibration is this uh optional purchase that you add right. on to your controller like i yeah. just thought that was such a neat idea and i mean that was quite a quite a cool thing that they did back then and it worked quite well i thought um but yeah interesting i i i think that vibration has a place in the future but i don't think it's 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 a massive thing one way or the other. I mean, maybe quite important for something in a, in a VR space, you could say. Yeah, it can be used very well. Like, say Wii Tennis, for example. The feedback mm. you get from every time you hit the ball, it actually giving you that, like, movement in your hand adds to that sense of immersion and that sense of, like, these motion controls are good and are working, yeah. you know? Like, definitely. I think definitely in that generation the Wii Remote having vibration was a pretty big deal because you were taking actions that were analogous in the real world to what you were doing on the screen, right? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, that's that's where it, it is that sort of fourth wall breaking feedback that is quite nice in video games. Um, like for, for example, my, my friend Shaq, who's staying with me, who owns a PS4, and I, I've talked about PS4 in the first segment, but basically... Yes. Um, he was mentioning this really cool thing that uh, GTA does, I believe, on the PS4, um, and that when like the so uh, the PS4 has this funny light on the controller, um, and he was mentioning that when like police cars are chasing you, it will actually flash like red and blue light just out, oh, really? out of the controller. And he was mentioning a few other games with like torches and things where it will just shine white light, and ah. it's just like it's this nice little external. Um, fourth wall encouraging thing uh, it's almost a bit like you know the wiimote with the speaker in it when you you pull yeah. back the bow and arrow in twilight princess or sure. sword and like it's little things like that i think Rumble... or even in games like no more heroes where someone will call you on your phone and you'll pick it up and they're talking to you through the speaker on the wii remote yeah and like that that stuff is cool but i don't think it's it's gay game defining this no i think a lot of that stuff comes down to being gimmicky ultimately i don't necessarily find vibration as a gimmick um it's i I don't know i think maybe it's been around so long that we just accept it as a standard at this point um but it's just yeah it's, it's strange it's it's one of those things that when it's used well i think it's fantastic and a great addition but then you don't necessarily miss it or notice it when it's gone it's Mm. it's a hard thing to kind of think about but um it's definitely an interesting uh, question, so thanks, Alias. Our next email is from Chaotix, who is from the internet. Hi, I'm Izedin Bali. I recently purchased Box Boy after your praise for it when it was uh, in the pre-E3 sale. Now I hear it also has a sequel too. Are there other cheap, simplistic indie titles or such for 3DS Wii U that you'd recommend? Chaotix. At PS, enjoy Majora's Mask once you get, get to it. Hopefully you won't get stuck on silly things like me. Well, we will enjoy Majora's Mask. Thank you. Um, eventually. eventually. It'll, it'll happen. But, Emmy Z, how about some quick fire? Say a game name and a reason you like it. An indie game on 3DS or Wii U. Okay. Um, I'm going to say VVVVVV. It's a really hard platformer where you just press one button to move up and down and dodge things, and it's like Super Meat Boy and hard. On 3DS. On 3DS. I'm going to say Shovel Knight. 
It's on 3DS and Wii U. It is a fantastic 2D, almost an action adventure platformer. Like it's just, it's got RPG elements. It's got Mega Man platforming elements, a bit of shooting, amazing boss battles, incredible music. Uh, would highly recommend. Um, I'm gonna say. Uh, I'm looking at my backlog to see if I can Black find Bailey. something. No, I'm going to leave that for you, Bally. You can, oh, you can okay. take that. Let's, let's um, I'm going to say Gum and Clive. Gum and Clive is an excellent uh, 2D uh, platform action game where you're a cowboy and the visuals are gorgeous. One of the best looking 3DS games when you put it in 3D. Uh, very quick, very cheap. Because uh, he was asking for like Box Boy price range. Gum and Clive is like one of the cheapest games on the eShop. Um, it's like two quid. So go play that. Uh, we mentioned it a second ago. Guacamelee incredible on Wii U I should add an incredible Metroidvania game in a Mexican um, art style um, interesting story it, it, it meshes Metroidvania with beat em up mechanics so you've got beat em up rooms but at the same time there's incredible boss battles great exploration um, and again fantastic music highly recommend Guacamelee and I'm going to say Thomas was alone, which was recently incredibly cheap on the Wii U eShop. It was 87 pence, and Bali, you just picked it up. Um, it is, you play as squares and rectangles, and there's a story, and it's really cool. So that's about it. I'm not going to say more than that. If you like puzzle platformers like Box Boy, I would highly recommend on Wii U The Swapper. It is I, I might even, looking back on it, I mean, I, we've already said I got a little bit burned by Box Box Boy, but the Swapper, I didn't feel anything like as burned on. It is an incredibly interesting, eerie, uh, space-esque uh, platforming uh, pu- 2D platform. What am I trying to say? 2D puzzle platformer. Um, you're cloning yourself, flicking switches. You, you evaporate in light, and oh, it, it's it's beautiful. I would definitely check that out uh any more do you want to do another round or is that enough bally's that's six games we've done that, that's six games why don't we just stick with six for All now right. six quick hits um, also super meat boy is now on wii u you have no excuse not to play that so there you go and i'm gonna Again, get lost i'm gonna get around to that as well um also axiom verge is coming out axiom verge of course our final email this week is from daniel m who is also from the internet how do you feel about HD remakes of classic NES games? Zelda 1 and or 2, Metroid, Excitebike, Ninja Gaiden. I had tons of fun with the DuckTales game that came out a few years ago, and since then I've wondered how awesome it would be to play some old Nintendo games. Um, he's got a second question lined up, but we'll, why don't we tackle the first one? Sure. Uh, so it's really interesting thinking about this because when I think HD remake of NES games, I think like, man, you'd have to do a full overhaul there. And that's really what the DuckTales game was. It was completely new artwork. It was uh, pretty much the same gameplay, funnily enough, um, but it was very much distinctive and different from the NES game. Um, I find that they'd definitely have to change certain things about how the games would play. Um, and their accessibility, because I think that's the one thing that mostly puts me off about NES games, um, is their obscurity and their weirdness. Um, Mm. So the graphical upgrade would be nice, but I actually think that the more important thing is making the game more playable. And one of the things that I didn't necessarily like about DuckTales was it pretty much kept the gameplay as similar as it was possible to be to the original, to the extent that I changed the difficulty down to easy for most of the game. And the reason was that on normal, when you lost a certain number of lives, you would have to restart the whole stage again, even if you got really far and got to checkpoint and bosses and everything. And I fucking hate that as game design Mm. goes. Like, it is one of the most archaic, infuriating things to me. And as a result, like... Yes, it was much easier to play on easy in terms of enemy difficulty and things like that, but it didn't give you these limited lives and it let you respawn as much as possible. So despite the fact that I was maybe playing a much more watered down experience from the game or the uh, moment to moment gameplay, I would much prefer doing that because it was more accessible and convenient for me as Hmm. a player, you know? I completely agree with you, MVZ, about ease of play um these examples that you've given daniel for like zelda one and two those are two games that are excellent examples where 
generally the games media just, ha just has so much respect for them but then if you're like someone new to gaming or the nes is before your time like us uh, when you come down and try to play those games you're like what is this this is horrible i can't actually do it uh, similar with metroid and metroid's a really interesting example where like i've played the first 20 minutes of the original metroid on nes on my ambassador program on my 3ds but I mean, that game was remade into Metroid Zero Mission. I think that is an incredibly impressive example of how an NES game can potentially be remade into something playable and exciting and modern. Um, yeah, totally. And, and I mean, there's there's completely different scales. Like that's a that's a really radical change compared to something like Ducktales. And then sure, I think something like Zelda One and Two. I think that maybe even if they weren't overhauled as drastically as Zero Mission, but just re-release those because they nintendo talks about the original zelda an awful lot they talked about it so much with wind waker and wind waker hd they've been mentioning it mentioning it constantly with breath of the wild about its open world experience all of this but ultimately it is a really really tough as nails game and it's just not fun to sit down and play it that you hit a brick wall every single second and it'd be so exciting if they could streamline that game or just make some of the really obscure puzzles I'm talking about, like a little more um, obvious. And obviously some Zelda hardcore will be like, no, you can't change it. But ultimately, you know, they managed to, they've managed to evolve other games to make it more applicable to a, a younger, fresher, newer audience. So like they need to, I would love them to do something to at least Zelda 1 or Zelda 2. Yeah, totally. Um, maybe if Nintendo don't do it, Perhaps the fans will, uh, and that is an interesting point to bring up right now because uh, at the moment we're on the verge of the release of a fan remake of Metroid 2 uh, on the Game Boy. Uh, Metroid 2 infamously a very difficult game to go back to, obviously um, no color, no map, it was on a small squished down screen. Uh, a fan has remade the entire game in color with a bunch of new stuff with map support and it is going to be released on PC as a download only like a uh, thing so you'll have to play it there you can't like play on Nintendo console obviously but i think it's very cool that there are people out there who are thinking about these things and who are doing the work that Nintendo aren't um and i'm very interested in that. i think i'm actually going to play that as opposed to playing Metroid 2 because i don't think Metroid 2's very good to go back to these days you know yeah, I mean, I would argue it's potentially better to go back to than something like the original Metroid. Sure. Uh, I was always in the realm of potentially being up for trying it one day, like yeah. in, on the on the 3DS Virtual Console. But uh, mm -hmm. I'd love to see a remake of a game like Metroid Two as well. And like, and from a, from a plot perspective, apparently it's quite sort of important in the whole. Yeah, you know, it is. It's quite yeah. an interesting thing they go for there. But yeah, interesting, interesting question, Daniel. And as for the second question. I am not on the VR bandwagon yet, but I am also curious of what Nintendo could do with this technology. Obviously, the Virtual Boy was a bomb, but VR today is so much better than 20 plus years ago. Are you two in favor of Nintendo dipping their toes in the VR waters? So Nintendo have been commenting a little bit more about VR recently. I think notably at E3, Reggie was saying a lot of stuff like... You know, we wait until the technology is established and the the technology is mainstream and affordable to a broad number of people, and, and then we think there. about how we approach it. Yeah, and it's just it's, he's right; it's not there. Um, obviously, Reggie infamously a couple of years ago was like, "Oh, VR is terrible and some bollocks," but you know, <laughs> Reggie has to say what Reggie has to say. He's a PR machine, and his mouth is full of shit. So. Everything he says is basically bollocks most of the time. But um, I do think that it will be interesting to see when Nintendo approach VR, because I think it will inevitably happen if VR takes off and becomes a mainstream thing. They're going to do something with it. Not necessarily soon, but in the future. I think that the way they'll approach it will be with a twist of some kind. They're not going to do the same headset. They're not going to copy and paste and follow and chase the market i think nintendo has been proved with a lot of their decisions they make kind of strike out on their own and want to approach design and approach hardware from a different angle and so 
I could see them more trying to blend VR with AR. We you know, you, Nintendo often talk about like trying to bring people together with games, and I think um, VR is definitely by its nature a isolationist thing. You are just stuck alone in your headset and uh, not really interacting with outside things. And I think if Nintendo could take that approach of being in a different space but also applying it so that you're interacting with the world around you at the same time that could be a very cool thing and maybe this sort of halfway house between what microsoft are trying to do with hololens and what the vr players are trying to do with their headsets um but yeah what that is i don't know i think that nintendo are also in a very unique position compared to definitely sony and microsoft where their franchises and their popularity and their fame worldwide is so generated by characters and not just characters but actual playable characters and the second you start thinking about characters such as Mario and Link in a in a first person VR experience you're almost losing some of that that little bit of magic that is Nintendo because you're ultimately not seeing those characters right, uh, and, you're and this inside and this was, them. And this was a huge criticism of when uh, the first Metroid Prime came out was, well, we can't see Samus. This is weird. Like, we like seeing Samus. Like, we we identify with that character. We want to see that character. And you're taking that away from us. You've completely changed the Metroid formula. You've made it first person. So I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility. I just think that there are some some very kind of unique hurdles that a company like Nintendo would have to tackle in the VR space. And don't get me wrong. VR Metroid Prime is like my absolute dream for what it could be. When you're talking about isolationist and VR is very sort of a lonely environment at NBZ, I completely agree. And that could be an incredible experience for a game like Metroid Prime. It could I be would the... shit myself <laughs> if I had to play Metroid Prime VR. I think I would, but I'd love it at the same time. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah. think it's, it's really... It's, it would be their creme de la creme of VR. Um, but, I mean, at the same time, Metroid Prime isn't their biggest seller, and that's not going to tempt them to want to delve into VR anytime soon. So I, I honestly can't see them uh, delving into it deeply um, anytime soon. I, I, I don't even know if... It, it's not sort of the technology that would be worth a, a one-trick pony peripheral like Nintendo yeah. would love to do. Um I definitely think their characters are important, uh, but I think there is something to be said about exploring the worlds that Nintendo create, like Hyrule and the surrounding areas and, you know, the the idea of Breath of the Wild being definitely. that the world is the focus. I think taking that into VR and focusing on the settings of their games rather than necessarily the characters and the mm. people of them um, is something that they could maybe leverage uh, if they or... go that way. Or what if, you know, all this controversy about not having female Link or playing a Zelda, what if the first time you play a Zelda is in VR and you can't yeah. even see her? Oh, but, great. The, <laughs> but the advantage is you can see Link. Sure. So, so you're like, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're fulfilling one goal, but going backwards in another. I don't know. I think it's, it's, you're right. Like the tech, the technology is just not there right now for Nintendo to want to get anywhere near it. They want to keep their consoles a bit cheaper. VR is nowhere near cheap at this point in time. It nope. probably, probably won't be for a good three, four, five, six years. Who knows? Um, will the NX ever have anything that links to anything VR related? I would put my money on no, quite frankly. I think this is potentially... This is them just keeping a little... Keeping their pinky pinky toe the tiny, like a tiny bit just in the water just to make sure they're up to speed a little bit with what's going going on in vr because we're still at that phase where we don't know if vr is going to be the next television screen you know right it 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 has that potential do i think it'll get there at some point probably not but it definitely is a possibility and i think nintendo would be mad to completely ignore it as potentially they have been for the last few years but we'll see yeah it's um i don't know it's very interesting times because i think those headsets came out and not many people are talking about them right now. Like it's it's one of those things. It's like it's definitely because no be a one slow owns burn. one. It's just yeah. like, it's just a few hardcore and like you know. It's one of the great things about going to Gamescom is we're gonna we're gonna try out some VR and we can yeah finally, totally we can finally stop talking from the sidelines and say we've tried it. This yes. is what we think. Um, yeah. So look forward to that. Absolutely. But anyway, 
I think that's all we've got time for, for emails. But once again, our email address is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. That is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. Keep all your emails coming in. We love them so much. We read all of them. Some of them are hilarious. Some of them are very frustrating. Others are, you know, an absolute joy. So we'd like more of them, and we hope you send them in. So that's all we've got time for this segment. Catch us after this musical interlude in the third segment where we're going to be talking about those NX rumors. Alright everyone, welcome back to the show for our third and final segment. And Bally, the rumour mill has started chugging along. We're just here, we're sitting in town, and we can see across the city, the smoke is rising. Things are happening, people are getting the rumours spread out there. And most of all, you're a gamer who has been doing some sleuthing, some source making, Dropping and some headlining. bombs. They are, that's what they're doing, apparently. If we are to believe, of course. We should all keep in mind, rumours are rumours, uh, and this could all very well be utter bullshit. Um, we do not currently know what the NX is. We do not currently know what the NX is. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let's start, uh, talk, we're, we're talking about NX rumours, the segment, of course. Uh, Bali, before we jump into that, we have an email that's related to it that I think will help kind of structure maybe a bit of this discussion, and uh, let's talk about all these aspects. Yes, we have an email from Jeffrey H, who's from New York City, who was wondering. So he, he talked about a number of games he is currently playing, but, we're, but we're, we're cutting straight to the chase of the NX question he's come up with. So he's saying, out of all the rumors that you guys have heard or read about the NX, which ones would you prefer to be true? Secondly, out of all the rumors of the NX, which ones would you prefer to be not true? Awesome work and can't wait for the next podcast. So we are going to make a little game out of Jeffrey's question here, and we're going to run down all the things that have been rumoured that Eurogamer has claimed are true about the NX, and uh, talk a bit about them and say whether we would prefer them to be true or prefer them to not be true. Uh, so let's start, Bally, straight out the bat, with the NX is a portable handheld console with a screen and detachable controllers on the side. Now we have a bit of a rudimentary artist's impression of what it would look like and essentially is as if you took two Wii remotes and strapped them to the side of a screen although the Wii remotes would have four face buttons on them and analog sticks and things like that. Um, so basically kind of maybe NES controls if you turn them on their side although a bit more functionality. Uh, how do you feel about this being the case? Because the the rumours of it being a hybrid and it being a handheld thing have been floating around for a while, and that's something that lots of people have speculated on. But this whole detachable controller idea is something we've not heard of before, and is curious. I wonder how it's going to work. I doubt that it's going to look like it does in the artist's impression. Would you prefer this to be true, or do you prefer that this was incorrect, Bali? Mm, I mean... I'm undecided, really. I think done well, and done in Nintendo's image, and done the way they want it to be done, it could work really well. And the idea that you have these detachable controllers that can then attach to each other, and then you have a separate screen, almost like a mini, like, I don't know, like being on a plane or something, and having like a mini screen that's separate that you can control. Uh, I think it could work well. Like I, I, it's confusing perhaps how that would link then to um, a dock and a TV screen, but I think there's ways to make it work, and I think it could be quite exciting. There are multiple issues with this, I think. So let's break them down. I think, first of all, 
how do you play on the tv when you have those two strands right like is it the fact that you're holding two separate pieces in your two separate hands and almost like two Wii remotes controlling stuff? Is there another thing that you attach them to to make it like a more traditional controller? Is there, in fact, no thing in between and you just attach these two small pieces and it becomes this very small kind of uh, controller-based thing? How does that work? Because I think... For me, I would prefer this not to be true if we're in a situation where we're holding two separate things to control things on the TV or if we're, like, crunching our hands really small to control it, you know? I think the best solution would be to just have a separate controller when you're using the TV, quite honestly. And I don't know that these detachable controllers would really do anything for the home scenario. Yeah, I, actually, that does make sense. Um like, I can't see why there can't just be, like you said, a separate game pad for when you're at home and it's in the dock and you're playing on the TV. And then for there to not be attachable buttons and then obviously the buttons are attached to the screen and then when you're on the go, you obviously use those buttons. Maybe the detachable controllers are taken into mind when we're thinking about docking it because perhaps the docking station is built such that it can only fit the screen itself. And so you would have to remove them in order to fit it in there. That could be, from an ergonomics perspective, an issue that they're trying to correct. It could also be the idea, and I think um, Tim Geddes and Greg Miller talked about this on the Kind of Funny Games cast, is the idea on a plane or on a car journey or whatever, having the ability to detach these two items and use them as controllers to play a multiplayer game in that setting and not having to have two devices uh, and therefore using wireless and whatever. You can just, on a single screen, play against each other, say Smash Brothers or Mario Kart, for instance, and that being the secondary use of them. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. Um, whatever it is, I, I think like they will have thought it through. And I think a lot of the issues that we're bringing up are obviously valid concerns, but I think they're issues that I would hope that Nintendo would think, actually, maybe that's a dumb idea, let's not do that. I think there are also issues based on the fact that the only mental image we have of this thing is in this weird, crude artist impression of what it could look like. And ultimately, Nintendo's design team and the people who, you know, figure out the ergonomics of their controllers and their handhelds will have thought about this significantly more And as such, when we finally see the device, I think it will make more sense. Like, imagine if it's, you literally split, say, the Wii U Pro Controller in half, and the handheld has those, um, you know, nice rounded edges that you can get your hand around, and it feels good. I think the one issue with that is, of course, portability and keeping it in your backpack. But then again, maybe that's why they're detachable, so you can easily carry it around. Um, I don't know. There's lots of issues. I think people have brought up the issues of, hey, what if... I forget a half of my controller and all of a sudden, like, I can't play any games because half my controller is left somewhere else in the house, you know? Like, it becomes, Mm. not only you lose one part of it, but it becomes this Lego that just is is an impossible thing to stay together, um, which I think people would be annoyed by. But I think fundamentally, I think I would prefer it to not be true. Um, I would like to think that... The, de- the detachable controllers could be a thing of convenience, not necessarily a thing that is needed to play the console. I'd rather mm. it's a thing where you detach them to dock it and then you just use a pro controller and then they're not really that useful otherwise. Um, exactly. Because even if you wanted to play something like Smash Brothers or Mario Kart on a plane, I don't imagine that a single analog stick plus those four face buttons are going to be a nice way to play that sort of game you need more than that in order to get the full experience so i mean what I don't if know. the what if the what if it has very what if the system it, the handheld part you're holding is very flat and has circle pads for when you're on the go but then when you're back in your home you, you put on the two attachable deep analog sticks so it's basically just making it more comfortable to play for longer periods but obviously less portable and then even and then on top of that, you could even have the option of bringing the non-portable version with you for people who are happy to not have a very ergonomic in terms of slipping in your pocket system, but in terms of really comfortable to play. So you can just like stick it in your bag. 
Yeah, like customizable parts of the controller. That's, yeah. That's a possibility. I know Xbox has their Elite controller, which has that stuff, where you can swap out the D-pad, and you can swap out a bunch of other things. So it's not like it's beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, things like that have been done before. So certainly uh, an interesting idea. Um, we'll see. That's I, I Definitely I'm falling down on not quite sure there. That seems like a, a weird one. Uh, but it is like one of the only kind of new pieces of news out of this, because I think a lot of this other stuff is stuff we've heard before and potentially is is linked to that in some way so we talked a little bit about it but the idea of docking to the tv bally um that this will be a console that is primarily a handheld but if you want to play it on a big screen there's some kind of device that you attach it to and it will beam it straight to that it will adjust the resolution it will create it so that you can play on your tv at home um is this something that you want to be true the the dock Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. And I, and I bought, so I bought the very, I bought the cheaper version of the Wii U, and obviously you got the basic, the, the basic, and you got the 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 pro black one. The um, deluxe. I, I was yeah. very, the deluxe. And I was very jealous of the the dock that that system comes with, and. I mean, I don't. So I don't have a dock for my new 3DS. I only had one for the, the old 3DS. Um, but the charging dock is what you're talking exactly, about. Exactly, the charging yeah. dock. I just think like a, a a cradle that you just stick a system in when you've just come out from out and about, or you've just been playing and you want to just charge it. The idea of not having to plug in something. The idea that you just drop it down onto something and then it somehow links up and etc. But through the contacts, it's just it's really satisfying. And I think that the between the old 3DS and the Wii U dock that you have, is like Nintendo have done it quite well in the past. So the idea that you can just plonk your system down and it's already linked up to your TV is a really, really great idea. It's one that I definitely would like to be true. Yeah, I think that for me, Nintendo's games have never been about this looks better than everything else it's never been about power it's never been you know i want realistic graphics and all this shit nintendo's games are about is the game fun to play is it good mechanically do i enjoy it and as a result i think a lot of people are dismayed the fact that is this is not necessarily going to be a traditionally powerful system like the ps4 xbox one and it's going to rely more on other aspects to define it and as such you know the the visuals you're going to get maybe for games like Zelda or things like the new Mario game are not going to be mind-blowing compared to what you get on other systems. But that idea of playing it both at home and away is a trade-off that I'm more than willing to take considering that I just like playing their games, you know? Like, it, mm. it just seems like a convenience that is really smart in a way that allows you even when you're away from home and potentially buy somewhere that has a tv to be able to get that console experience anywhere you know like imagine being at a hotel and having the dock with you and just through hdmi linking it and just not having to worry about you know this bulky ps4 or xbox one you're carrying around you have that big tv experience wherever you want yeah that no that is cool and that's something i'm very excited about um but that, I mean, that's also a really interesting area is this idea that for the first time you're bringing Nintendo home console experiences with you on the go. Well, it's not the first time. There's always been remakes of, say, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask that are now portable for the 3DS. Uh, but this idea that having Breath of the Wild on the go, like, do you think that top-down Zelda, 2D Zelda, you know, Link Between Worlds Zelda, is, is that is that going to be hurt in any way, do you think, by this idea? That, Man. Or do you think they, do you think Zelda, there's always going to be room for 2D Zelda and they're still going to have a 2D Zelda in the same way, maybe? I mean, for example, Four Swords came out on GameCube. That's quite a good example of the other way. So Right, yeah. Like, it, it, our con is the console experience going to be handheld or are they still going to design specific handheld experiences that's a really interesting question it's it's over po the years pokemon's a huge question as well but yeah. it is yeah over the years nintendo have basically segregated their franchises into handheld and home console variants and as such you get pretty different experiences from the both of them um so the question being, like, if this is encompassing both, do they have a reason anymore 
to design those specifically handheld ones when you have the power of you know a wii u or a ps3 essentially like how we don't know how powerful this thing is going to be but it, it's looking is maybe... it the final nail in the coffin for 2d metroid oh, oh god please don't <laughs> don't my be, be still my beating heart um but yeah if, if this thing is like between xbox one power and say wii u power when you have that kind of stuff to go on, does it make sense to? And I think to some degree you can say yes, because Nintendo have had this 2D renaissance that started with um, the new Super Mario Brothers series and carried on with Kirby's Epic Yarn and Donkey Kong Country Returns and all those kind of things. So I think that Nintendo still uh, realize their roots there and, and they like that stuff. So despite the fact that we're moving maybe into a more console-based style of play on the go i think they'll still think about those experiences and how to tailor them for the handheld market because really like the thing that's great about the 3ds is a lot of those games are designed around the fact that hey i need to do something quickly and then go you know like fire emblem you can bookmark in the middle of a map um a bad example is luigi's mansion where you can't save in the middle of those mansions and that kind of sucked that's one of the reasons i think Mm. that game is is not super well designed i think it's a great game but when it comes to actually being a good handheld game it has issues so that is something they have to overcome and they have to think about you know there's it's just a different perspective really on how to approach game design uh from both perspectives so yeah um it's it's a, it's a tough challenge, but I'm sure they're going to approach it as with as much vigor as they can. The other massive burning question I've been dying to ask you this, I keep forgetting M B Z. Okay. Um, we are now of the opinion that obviously it's 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 handheld versus home home console. It's all of Nintendo's eggs in one basket. It is. Like, yeah. do you think they would have been so up for sticking all their eggs in one basket had there not been you know the success of the mobile market and so like my point is they are all eggs in one basket to some degree but ultimately they still have their mobile games that they're going to try and go for with obviously animal crossing fire emblem uh mitoma's already been out so is that how is that their backup plan like is that the way that they diversify their risk i mean to some degree perhaps um would, would they have still gone gung-ho with the nx had they not even got delved into the mobile market at all do you think i don't yeah i don't think they do i think had wii u and 3ds been a success like they don't have a reason to change their strategy right because mm-hmm. their strategy was a winning strategy for however long it, it lasted um that means that they definitely have to pledge all their bets they can on one system and doing so hopefully will get them out of the situation they're in but the mobile market is there as a as a backup to some degree the thing i worried about about the mobile market is how how fleeting it is and how companies do not have a solid foothold there regardless of who you are like you think about angry birds and Sure, that was a meteoric success and people still play it, but that company is not doing as well as they used to, and I doubt that's going to get any better. And the thing is, unless you are someone who can diversify and make multiple franchises that sell and are successful, it becomes a thing where you're forgotten and people move on to the next thing. And though Nintendo have long-lasting franchises, I don't know that they can necessarily, you know tread water on mobile as successfully as they might think they can because it's just such a casual audience of people who Mm. don't stick to anything they just move from one thing to the next and forget about the last thing they did so i mean i mean we always talk about and and a lot of games journalists they talk about how video games is a very very young industry especially when you compare it to something like film for example it is and film has evolved so much over its long history and video games are still so young but what's even more young and changing even faster is is mobile games and it's just crazy yeah. the idea that mobile games can be like a stable pillar of nintendo's business plan i think is false because i just think is, i yeah. agree with you it's incredibly casual um and i think in many ways for the reasons of the same way that popularity in the Wii dropped off so fast was because it was so casual you know people bought the Wii they played it casually with Wii Sports and didn't get buy anything else that's a very casual experience. the Wii I think has one of the worst attach rates of any console in history because exactly. of that reason 
And I think that there's every danger that mobile games might do the same. Like it might be a very quick peak and then a horrendous trough afterwards. And yeah. that's where the NX is, needs to be the stable pillar going forward. And uh, one of these articles, we sh- maybe we'll talk about it now, um, but it mentions that Nintendo's intention is to upgrade smartphone gamers. And really this talks to the idea that they had uh, this big audience around the DS and Wii who moved on to just play stuff on their phones. And they potentially would like to recapture those people if possible. Um, I think that's kind of an impossible task in, in some senses, but how do you think that that's something that they could go about doing, Bal? Do you think NX will appeal to them in that way by like feed, drip feeding them through the mobile games and then saying by the way you can get something that's a bit more fully fledged over here or do people who play those games just care about that and and don't own a main you know an actual console for for a reason yeah it's a really really tricky one um i, I would be of the opinion that the vast 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 like 99.9 percent of people playing mobile games Pokemon Go is such a great example. Like, I, how many of those people playing Pokemon Go that I know are going to go on and say, actually, there's a new Pokemon game out later this year um, on 3DS. I'm going to pick up a 3DS and Sun, Sun or Moon and play that as a result of Pokemon Go. I'm like, I'm really skeptical that there's going to be that carryover. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think Nintendo will push hard for there to be carryover between their mobile games and um nx games but i i i'm skeptical of it yeah because most people who play games on their phones just do it because they have their phones with them that's Mm. the key ingredient here is they are not willing to carry around a dedicated device because the device they carry around with them all the time regardless has stuff for them to do when they're bored and exactly it's 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 the whole fast food versus steak argument you know it's it's everyone needs to eat but i'm very busy and i don't want to sit down and go to a nice restaurant have a big steak and you know like us buy a 3ds buy a exactly. proper gaming experience buy an actual pokemon game um i just want the quick fast food option because it's cheap it's easy um and i can do it on the go and that's what just what pokemon go is hit at you know it's it's really it is, yeah I, I yeah i'm still convinced it's hard to transfer people who like mcdonald's into fine restaurant diners <laughs> i mean there are people who like both for sure but uh, absolutely yeah, yeah yeah um so let's uh take the next point then uh i think this is one that has been rumored for a while and on nintendo's own documentation it kind of hinted at this for breath of the wild is the fact that the nx is going to use cartridges apparently um mm. which would make sense for a handheld device you don't want any moving parts in there we've seen the psp uh made a bad decision by having the umds and the moving yes. things that made them break horribly um so cartridges make 100 percent sense when people think cartridges i think they all think oh you know the old big chunky nes things and the super nintendo cartridges these days you know you look at the 3ds it uses cartridges they're tiny they're sd cards they're mm. very portable they have a huge amount of memory capacity to them um and they seem like something that could work also they don't really have load times uh, which is something that nintendo was very keen on in the n64 era it's why they lost final fantasy is because they started to use cartridges and everyone else was using discs um bally how do you think that cartridges uh, will work here do you think that this is something you want uh is this uh a good thing for the nx 100 percent. if it's not cartridges it has to be downloads only and if it's not that it has to be discs doesn't it there's not really anything else right yeah and, there's not many other storage and... mediums and, you know, am I confident they're going to put tons of storage into the system? Potentially not. Like, I think it will have a hefty amount of storage, hopefully more than the Wii U. But I don't think they'll sell it, you know, like a, we were just talking about PS4 and storage. Like, it's not going to be like a 500 gigabyte storage, you know. I think it will be smaller than that. And as a result, you need you need games. And I think you're not going to want a disc like you said you don't want moving parts you're right the psp was just a hot mess literally almost because you know the second you have moving parts you need fans you need to keep it cool it needs to be the right angle there's all these problems and like the technology even from stuff as simple as ipads like the the, the technology in devices with non-moving parts has just taken off so much that they'd be mad to to not go for that 
Yeah, it's like I'm, that's the thing that lines up most with the idea of it being a portable first is cartridges is going to be the main medium through which we will play stuff. And yeah, I I definitely hope it's true to some degree. I think um, if you're talking about digital downloads and how much space this thing will have, SD cards are pretty big these days. You can probably get a 500 gig SD card that you can just pop in there and essentially have the same amount of storage that a, a out of the box ps4 does you know so if you're worried about how much space you're going to be able to carry on this portable i don't think you should worry about that because there are solutions to it and it's so cheap these days like 32 gig sd cards are incredibly cheap and that's one benefit that the 3ds has over the vita is like there's no proprietary memory cards needed like vita memory cards are fucking absurd pricing which is why i don't have one that's like higher than eight gigs because i can't like that's stupid it's like 120 quid for a vita memory card that's like 32 gigabytes it's absolutely insanity um and 3ds sticking with standard you know normal format which you can just get anywhere made a lot of sense i think nintendo would be stupid to make their own proprietary stuff i think just stick with what you know and stick with what works and that will allow people more choice it'll allow more competition in that marketplace and um ultimately give people the option hey if you want to go all digital we have the solution and you can mm. store as much as possible on, on this device. And for God's sake, if it uses micro SDs, do not put it behind like a screwdriver access oh, right, panel. Yeah. Like, oh God. I definitely think the one thing to be worried about there is piracy. Um, if you're using an SD card, you could potentially have some piracy issues and 3DS has been able to patch some stuff out. People have figured out ways around it. Um, but yeah, they... they they need to uh, make sure that they have all that stuff locked down. Um, but not too locked down that it's all region locked or shit, because we don't want that anymore. Please, Nintendo, I, I, please don't I, region lock. I, I know that's not one of your suggestions, but it's I, not, no. I, I bet they're going to region lock again. <laughs> oh, fuck off. Don't. Don't do it. Um, so, okay, so I think both of us are like, yeah, we probably would like cartridges. Uh, the next one is no backwards compatibility. Um I think we've talked about how we think this is going to happen regardless. Uh, I still would like it to be not true to some degree, um, especially in the realm of 3DS. Like if we're talking that this is oh, yeah, cartridge based, just about 3DS is where it would make sense to have some backwards compatibility. Uh, obviously, you know, with Wii U discs the way they are, that wouldn't make sense. But the potential of, hey, the digital versions of those Wii U games, that's the way you could circumvent it, possibly. Mm. Um, your Nintendo accounts, your My Nintendo stuff is all linked up. They know what you own. Yeah. So it's definitely possible for them to uh, allow you to download it. But um, I, uh, yeah, it's. I would like backwards compatibility not being there to be untrue. I would, I would hope it in some form we get a. Bit I remember of it. we had this a brief discussion where I was suggesting that yeah, you could. It like my Nintendo does know all the games I own, even discs, not just digital. And you mentioned the problem that if it just reads it off that, then people can just lend each other discs and then download whole games. Yeah, you know what I mean? to some so degree. Like, so, like, there are issues. I completely think that the bare minimum should you should be able to get all like your downloaded indie games and virtual console games over. I think that just should be a bare minimum, surely, to just transfer them across. You um, think it, that, but then like neither PS4 or Xbox One did that out of the box. Like neither of them gave you access to your previous indie lineup on the other the, consoles. But, so. You say indie lineup, but Nintendo have beyond an indie lineup. You know, they're, they're so focused on their virtual console and you know. virtual console. Obviously, is the difference here. I think virtual console, yeah. like if you don't have parity with virtual console, like fucking get out of here. Like at this point, they need to sort their shit. Exactly. It's it's. If I have to download any game I want to play again, I will be absolutely raging. Like it's just ridiculous. Or at least, the, maybe even the bare minimum to do something like they did with the Wii, Wii to the Wii U, where you paid, the little upgrade fee. You paid yeah. like a pound or something per game, and just for like say twelve pounds or so, you could just upgrade all your games. I mean, I've, I've I, I would say got, that was worth it because you got the save states and you got the you added got functionality. You're right. If this is the same functionality, then you're kind of asking, well, why? You know, they have to do something. Uh, more. There the, has to be I an mean, extra the, step. I think the new functionality is you can take it on the go. Right, but then like there are SNES games on the new 3DS, so true. It's yeah, it's it's a it's a very unstable thing i uh, also right I, I also agree that if it 
like we just said, like it uses cartridges. It'd be so cool if it was like the 3DS with DS games where you could just slip 3DS games into the NX and it's just play them. Like I think that would be really, really cool. Um, I I think it could happen. Maybe not. I mean, it's it's tight. I mean, and obviously, definitely no to Wii U discs. There's just no hope in hell. It's, it's just yeah. not going to happen. Forget it. Forget about it. Um, so the next thing up is the kind of graphical processing that the uh, unit will be using and uh, reports from Eurogamer seem to think that it will be uh, a Tegra chip which is a mobile Nvidia chip Bally Nvidia are a company who do graphics stuff I have an Nvidia graphics card in my PC they're pretty much the top of the market Um, they do a lot of uh, graphics for people so uh, they're a very reputable company and the Tegra is supposedly a pretty powerful chip uh, and people that's why people are saying the power level is going to be somewhere above Wii U a little bit below Xbox One um, and people are thinking that it's going to be their first generation X1 chip which uh, they don't 100% know that's the case they're also speculating it could be the X2 which hasn't come out yet they haven't really said anything about it which is a bit more powerful but uh, at the moment what we know is that it will be a mobile based processing unit Um, and I think that this is good to some degree because it means that it's going to be a very powerful unit Um, I don't know how great that stuff is aside from mobile devices like obviously they'd have to adapt it to their own os and their own format and everything um but i just don't know like how long these things last whether they're that reliable um over a long period of time because i think one of the things about phones is their planned obsolescence and how the parts degrade over time and that becomes a big issue um i think nintendo definitely have to work to make it so that all the parts in this stuff and are not like gonna go downhill terribly yeah i it just seems so powerful like this system it's making me really scared about power and battery life. it makes me scared and... about price really as well battery life price um, like all these things are, are a little bit worrisome price is one of those interesting things where me personally i do not mind paying a massive i i would pay up to you know four or five hundred quid for this thing like right absolutely we fan. would because yeah, we're crazy precisely. and we're gonna buy it because we're crazy we're, we're crazy we just put a nintendo stamp on it we buy it but <laughs> so we're right. crazy but unless it's an amiibo of course unless it's an amiibo. so personally like you said we're not bothered about price but it is worrying if it does end up going far too high knowing how affordable many of nintendo systems have been in the past from 3ds to wii u and things like yeah. that so that would concern me but yeah in terms of battery life um i don't i don't know how you like i don't know enough about the technology of like lithium batteries and stuff but how do you you know make sure it lasts a long time if it's so... yeah i don't know it's like they've had this issue with so many of their recent um hardware what's, iterations. what's v- vita's battery like vita's battery life is okay it's like five hours on a full charge i guess like it's pretty good um mm. i don't know what stuff they're using that but uh really like from all accounts this sounds like a more powerful vita you know like it sounds like a souped up version of that which is a strange mm. direction to go in given like how unsuccessful the vita has been but Nintendo and their games are, are a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't. We, we don't know enough about um, graphics processes and chips to really have a good discussion here, Bali. No, um, no. But yeah, I kind of hope it's true. I, to me, I kind of hope that they go for something that is powerful but not too expensive, um, because I think that could cost them in the long run. Um, mm. Definitely. So. Uh, then, like, some some more comments that were being made. Apparently, Nintendo's not chasing graphical parity, which, of course, we've talked about before. We know that that's not what mm. they're aiming for. I think the one thing that worries me um, about that statement is its potential reference to how well games are going to run on the portable and my feelings of, you know, stuff running at 30 frames per second versus 60 and how mm. that could shake out. I think definitely, for me personally, I think 30 on a handheld is more bearable because of the, the resolution being the lower and the size of the screen. Yeah. It doesn't, for some reason, doesn't affect you as much. Um, 
whereas when it's beamed to the tv i don't like i don't know how much power is going to be in this docking station right we don't know what that's gonna actually do for it what that technology will be and how it will transform it and and make it better on on the big screen and if it doesn't do things like improving frame rate that might be a little bit of a worry um but we're we're gonna have to wait and find out because i'm sure all these concerns if indeed any of this is true because this could all be bullshit as we've said Mm. um yeah, I'm, I'm interested when the event happens for that stuff. And, uh, and then there was... Sorry, what were you going to say? Um, I was just going to add one more thing at the end. It's, it's a good one to wrap up, so you go first. Okay, well, uh, the other things that we were going to hear about were from MVC, not the Nintendo Voice Chat, MVC, I should say, which is a UK publication, who said uh, that apparently Mario and Pokemon are coming within the first six months of this console's lifespan, and uh, Nintendo are very much uh, trying to upgrade smartphone gamers with this thing, which we talked about before, and that they're not chasing after PS4 players, and apparently PS4 players are not going to be interested in this system, um, which is an interesting statement to make. Uh, but I think the, the meat of the core of what they were saying was Mario and Pokemon within first six months. Does this make any sense? I don't know. Sun and Moon are coming out in November, and Game Freak really going to turn around another game in six months? That seems like a weird statement to make. I think Mario is believable for sure. We know EAD, or should I say EPD at this point, Tokyo, uh, are working on the new game, and they have been for some time, and Miyamoto said probably next E3 is when we'll see it. But Pokemon, that's where this kind of comes into play, and apparently this is from the same source that gave Eurogamer information. So where there's smoke, there's fire, Bally, I think. I don't know that... I think this might start to delegitimize this uh, this whole rumor mill because I do not see a full Game Freak another Pokemon being released in six months. I know people make the argument it could be a Sun and Moon uh, port, but is that really what they're going to do? I don't know. I, I would... If it is true, I'd bank on it being like a, like a fire red leaf green. Like a... What's the next generation that they need to remake? Uh, fourth gen now. Is it now fourth gen? So it is, yeah. Could it be a remake of Diamond and Pearl? I don't, is it that could easier? be uh, the third version. It could be Pokemon Star, you know, Sun, Moon, Star, maybe. Star, yeah. A souped up um, version, perhaps the third iteration that they kind of left behind with X and Y, but they could go back to it, uh, maybe. Or, I mean, what if they went back to the idea of Fire Red, Leaf Green, and revamp Red and Blue? How cool would that, that be? That actually would make a lot of sense. That uh, would be Like, glorious. given the 20th anniversary, given the fact that all these nostalgic people are playing Pokemon Go. I like that shout, Bally. That's a good call. Another remake of Red and Blue uh, on NX would be a really attractive proposition uh, for mm. a lot of people. That, uh, that would and, and help get people Surely that is the best way to access the Pokemon Go market. Is to it is, probably, yeah. Stick to the original 150. Totally. One. <laughs> no, I like that. That's a really good shout, Bally. That is, that's a, a smart call there. Um, so maybe that's where they go with it. Who knows? Um, but is this something we want? 100%. I think Nintendo should have Mario and Pokemon and all their franchises. Not all their franchises, but um, I think people have mentioned, like, Nintendo need to have everything at launch, this, this, this. And to some degree, that would be great. But also, we need to consider why Wii U failed and what was the problem wasn't necessarily just that the launch was bad it was that they didn't have a steady stream of good software over a long period of time and so Mario may not be at launch and Pokemon may not be at launch but they need to be coming out at a frequent basis along the months as NX goes on we can't just open with everything and then have a vapid blank space for the rest of the year they have to fill it with stuff and so there needs to be a steady trickle of good releases coming at a good pace. So uh, Mario and Pokemon, yes, don't put them out at launch. Put them out when they're ready and when it, the time is right for the next software lineup to come. So so my final point was to do with timing. And it's that okay. the, ru- the rumor was that the announcement and reveal of what the NX is going to be is September. Yeah. That uh, is near. A, a- it is very close. We're in August right now. It's literally next month. Um, so I think a lot of people speculated September would be the smart time. I would it was prefer far that enough to be away true. from E3. It was far enough away from the end of the year. It's nice. There's nice little middle ground. And uh, I think that they can capture people's attention in September because there's not a lot of big games coming out then. Um, bit of a dip, bit of a lull. And they need to talk to people and tell people why they need this new system and what is so great about it. And uh, I believe that it will be a fun time, for sure, Bally. 
Um, I'm excited. Uh, this whole year has been leading up to this moment, I feel. Like, this is the one centerpiece of Nintendo uh, that everyone is curious about. And, of course, we've been talking about it the whole year. We'll continue to talk about it because it's what they've got going right now. Um, I'm happy, Bally. I'm in a place of excitement, for sure. Oh, definitely. It's all It's all looking rosy now. It is. So... Uh, all that in mind, uh, thanks for listening. This was a good episode, I think, Mal. You had a fun time. And uh, we are going to tell you things before we go. It's the end of the episode. So uh, before we go, we want to remind you of a few uh, things in the pan cooking right now. Uh, we have, of course, our Earthbound Backlog Club, uh, which at some point in September we will play... Uh, well, we're, we're going to play through it before then, but we will talk about it in September at some point. So... If you haven't yet uh, gotten on that, you still have about, you know, probably over a month to do so. It's a long game. Uh, get stuck in. You can get it on the Wii U Virtual Console and on the new 3DS uh, on Super Nintendo Virtual Console there. And uh, we'd like to hear some emails from you. And you can send in your thoughts on Earthbound uh, and all of your ideas about it and everything to our email address, which Bally will tell you right now. The email address is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. That is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. We want your thoughts on Earthbound. Yes. Please, please do send those in. Uh, it's always a fun discussion bringing in uh, what people who listen to the show uh, think about the game that we're playing. And we've had some good uh, good chats in the past with our, our previous Backlog Club, club games. Um, so we'd like to continue that. Uh, another thing we should probably let you know, we are going to be at Gamescom 2016 in Cologne, Germany, Bali. It's very exciting. We got uh, the press we actually, passes. Yeah, we just got uh, press passes uh, to go to Gamescom. Uh, through the podcast, we have passes which have this Nintendo Life written on them, which is pretty cool, Bally. I mean, and that's that's thanks exciting. to everyone who listens to the podcast. Like, it is, it was, yeah. We wouldn't get the press passes if the podcast didn't exist. Exactly, and if people didn't listen. So uh, thank you for everyone for doing that, uh, which means we're going to have uh, some access to certain things, kind of, maybe. We'll see. We've got some things to figure out. Uh, but we're going to be doing coverage of Gamescom, uh, making some videos, doing some podcasts about it, and uh, I'm sure that stuff will be great. But we also want to say, if you're going to Gamescom, uh, let us know. Tweet at us, at TNL Podcast, and tell us and make you meet some of you at the show. That would be really cool. Um, we can also be found on our individual Twitters. Bally, how are you on the internet? Where can you be found? I can be found at Ballyman91 on Twitter. That is B-A-L-L-Y-M-A-N-9-1. That's also my name on the Meverse, where I'll hopefully be posting some more Fire Emblem in, as I get closer to the end of that game. Chugging along, as, Chugging as per usual. Along. Uh, you can find me at LordNBZ on Twitter. That is the same on Meverse. Uh, I think... People can find the show in different places, uh, and one of those places is iTunes. Uh, you can go there, subscribe, download. Every two weeks we come out. We're always uh, on the Monday to be downloaded. You find us also on Stitcher, and uh, you can find us on uh, YouTube, uh, usually a couple of days after the audio has gone up on the other feeds. Uh, I am pretty sure that that's pretty much it, Bali. Are there any other things we need to wrap up before we end off the show? I was just going to say that with so much content coming with, you know, the podcast and the videos we're hoping to do at Gamescom, the best place to keep on track of all of it is the Twitter account. So it's it at is. TNL Podcast. That's at TNL Podcast. Give us a follow on Twitter and you'll be up to date with all our goings on. You will indeed. That's, uh, that's a smart call there, Bally. Um, and uh, that's going to be the last smart call of the show because we're going to end it here. Um, thanks everyone for listening we'll be back at you again in a couple of week time uh, I think after we've been to Gamescom uh, because that's around the weekend that yeah we'll, we'll, ha- we'll have to think about how we're going to do it but we'll yeah maybe we'll the know. show might be a little late next time we'll, we'll see uh, we should be okay um, because if there's one thing about I strive for I strive to get the show out on time and I'm oh, usually yes. uh, good oh, about yes. it um, so uh, hopefully things will work out uh, we'll let you know of course as, as we said follow us on the social medias uh, to find out more but uh, that will be us so thank you everyone for listening we'll speak with you next time until then goodbye
The musical interludes used on today's show were the title theme from AM2R and the Force theme from Star Wars. <laughs>